chapter 19, in which I confront the incredible and accept the impossible. The alchemical goal, a marriage of all elements. Galliard of the old stars. Concerning the properties of certain magical objects. The flaw in the formula. They had raised a black cross amongst the ruins and hanged my betrothed upon it. I had heard her speak of Christ and the necessity of the ritual of repetition, but I had not once guessed her full intention. She was dying, I was convinced. Overhead the sky swam with turbulent dust, and the light from the old stars faded, flickered and expired. Exhausted rays fell upon her body. Then her eyes lifted up to the heavens and met mine. I was horrified by her sweet smile. Hermes to my Aphrodite, she called. My husband comes. Monsorbier saw us descending now, and although he could not move the vessel in which he caught the drops of her blood, he grew greatly agitated. He was inspired, I knew then, by profound jealousy. He shouted, Ha! Here comes Citizen Cockerel flapping to the slaughter. Fly away, little rooster, you are not needed here. Your hens call you back to your coop. Though she could only be in inconceivable pain, Labussa carried her familiar authority. Beware, Monsorbier, you are commissioned to perform certain tasks. Perform those and no others. He sulked. Her blood dripped, bead by precious bead, into the upturned helm. From amongst the mumbling crowd now stepped the golden girl, the same as sacrifice the lamb, and she was singing in Latin, much garbled, with some Greek and, I guessed, Hebrew. The entire ensemble joined in that hymn, and Monsorbio's reply, if any, was drowned. Pale St. Audrin trembled in disgusted terror. There's naught to do here, Von Beck. She conspires in her own blasphemous martyrdom. If we linger, we'll be drawn in for certain and destroyed. I was calm, reconciled now. Do you not understand, dear friend, that this is my destiny as well as hers? I feared you would grow mad as she, he said soberly. Will you try to listen to reason, Von Beck, for love of what you were? I have no love, St. Audrin, for what I was. I have changed beyond redemption and must fulfil what fate demands. I smiled at him. He drew back, gasping as if I were leprous, and my stretched hand could not touch him. You're Satan's creature now, Von Beck. Always, it seems. I was tranquil. There's no sinister meaning. Sir, until but lately you were a human soul, a good heart. Now you are possessed. I'll wait a day for you, no longer. As I threw the ladder groundwards, I shook my head, pitying his ignorance. I must away now, my friend, to the wedding. I'm much disappointed you do not see your way clear to keeping your word. He took a step or two across the gondola as if to stop me, but I had swung over and was climbing towards the smouldering wasteland and an oblivious congregation of witnesses whose eyes were entirely held by that dark crucifixion, the manifestation of what prophets had called Antichrist, the new Messiah. Rejecting God, this Messiah claimed the earth in the name of mankind. As part of that destiny, I would be second only to she, whose wisdom had reorganized my blood and illuminated my soul. Clinging to the ladder, I looked down on all her witnesses. The wind drummed against the balloon's canopy like a tremendous heartbeat. The surrounding silhouettes of buildings waved like agitated wheat. The dust formed shapes in a huge sky, and behind it still glowed the autumn stars. I jumped the last few feet into the hot ashes of the friend indeed. Embers flew about my legs, smoke attacked my eyes, yet I waded unconcerned through the red-hot debris until I reached the congregation. Most there were taller than I, and I could see nothing of the cross. I pushed against bodies as cold as corpses, but they did not resist and at last I stood to the left of the golden priestess. 
Monsorbier turned, lifting the bowl, crying out until the hymn gradually died and they waited again in silence. My lady hung upon the great cross, her head limp against her left shoulder, her body white as if every drop of blood was drained. I could not see her breathing. I record these events to the best of my memory. While much is vivid, some is vague, and one image blends with another. Some was doubtless illusion, much definitely was not. In my days I had decided all was preordained. To play my part in it was effortless, for I merely followed my own desires. No prayer was ever more fervent than my prayer to her, for to whom else should I pray? That she complete her ritual and be resurrected. Now I knew why Prince Miroslav had been so afraid, for like so many of his generation, he reverenced God and believed that blasphemy must surely be punished. Monsorbier's voice lifted like a bishop's. Here is the grail, here is the blood of the Antichrist, mixed with the divine tincture. Here is sulphur, mercury, salt and cinnabar. Here is gold and silver and an essence of rubies. Here is the stone made liquid, and he displayed that battered helmet as if it were the crown of Zeus. So saith Marduk, I shall maketh my blood solid, I shall maketh bones therefrom, I shall raise up man from my own dismembered flesh, so saith Marduk. So saith Marduk, they gave chorus again as they had at the sacrifice of the lamb. When the Holy One, blessed be, created the first of our race, they were called androgynous, intoned the priestess. So saith the Holy One. So saith the Holy One. Behold, she cried, the truth hath been revealed to thee. The seed hath been sown. The seed hath been sown. Whomsoever sows the Holy Cryosperm shall know rebirth for eternity. They shall know the secret of holy metals, the alchemical tree, the seven waters and the thirteen vapours. The tree is cut down, the tree is reborn. And while she chanted, Monsorbier, reluctantly, yet helpless, to do, helpless as anyone to do otherwise, came slowly towards me, offering me the helm and outstretched hands. Behold, shouted the priestess, the male that is female shall be wedded to the female that is male, brother to sister, mother to son, daughter to father. Here is the old king dying and the young king being reborn. Here is Kibrit come to Albaida, his sister, to be swallowed in her womb. From darkness there shall come light. From darkness shall come light. So shall Hermaphroditus come from the fountain of Salmasus, and the two become one. Animate and inanimate shall be called Rebus, which is our stone. Immortal it shall be whole, self-reproducing with the sum of all our wisdom. Thus at last, chimed in Monsorbier, is Christ re-crucified, Christ made complete, Christ who is man and woman and the child of man and woman. Thus the plural is abolished, and he abandoned, and he handed me the upturned helm which I took in my palms. Swirling gold, dark red and green, the elixir gave off a gentle delicious vapour. That tincture which in the alchemical belief was the essence of divine wisdom, as it was the essence of my labusa. Drink, cried the priestess. The ritual must be completed, and we shall witness the crucifixion and resurrection of the female Christ, the marriage of opposites, the final reconciliation. Then shall harmony come upon the earth. Drink. I drank. It was salty, sweet, heady. My stomach attempted to reject it, but... If I was to be married, I knew I had to consume every drop. I took another sip. The witnesses had now disrobed. 
their limbs were pale in the light of the autumn stars. The black dust swirled around them. The coals glowed red. They watched as I drained the cup. They moaned with ecstatic approval. Monsorbier took the grail from my hands. The priestess reached out to me. I feared her. I was suspicious of her. She was ally to the beast. I believed it wrong she should officiate at the ritual. Neither should Monsorbier have been there. But few others were now alive. The priestess came towards me again and I could not draw back. She and Monsorbier removed my clothing until I stood naked before the black cross, my sword raised before me in my two fists. They withdrew. I was alone with my mistress, her face serene in its power. Even though life had left her lacerated body and swept through my own like a tremendous tide, through every channel of my being, it was as if I were the universe and was populated by elementals. Never had I known such strength. From behind me the priestess declaimed, So shall ye be the second of the two, the whole, the creature some call Antichrist, but which is called in the secret law Christos Androgynos, the Lord that is both man and woman. Stiffly upright I was lifted upon the backs of the witnesses and used my sword to prise loose the nails, then catch her in my arms as she fell. She was my sweet love. She was my Labusa who taught me the meaning of lust. Her cold body hung in my arms. First comes the resurrection, then the marriage, then begins the eternal rule when justice and equality shall be the same as harmony and all shall be whole. We shall have achieved the end of the world's pain. The sword of Paracelsus, my gift from Satan, was slung over my naked back. Bearing her limp remains, I stood ankle deep in the black ashes beneath the great cross. They surrounded us again, the witnesses chanting with uplifted hands. Monsorbier and the golden girl, priest and priestess of this rite, were the leading voices. I scarcely saw them as I looked upon the face of my tutoress. I looked upon undaunted faith. The winged one with two heads shall stand upon the pyre of old hope. Here is the cup and here the sword. Where is the beast? Now it seemed a great lion stalked through the ruins. In his jaws the body of a pelican. Round his neck a snake. And he was crowned with yellow lilies. The witnesses fell back before him. He stood upon a spur of fallen masonry, and, dropping the pelican from his mouth, lifted his head to utter a great triumphal roar. The roar echoed amongst the swaying towers of the deeper victory, amongst the autumn stars, at once the lament and a victory shout, and there from beneath the feet there suddenly burst, burst a huge fount of silvery water which washed away the ash and the coals. The lion vanished, but the fountain remained. It was the same O'Dowd had spoken of, the old spring upon which the inn was founded. It was gushing mightily now as I carried my labusa into the centre. The water was so powerful it appeared to dissolve us as our bodies were washed and grew white. Moaning, Labusa stirred in my arms, and a tracery of blood sprang from her wounds, and was at once washed away. Labusa, Labusa, mistress of my desire, wake, I beg you. She opened her astonishing eyes and smiled at me. It is as it should be, she said softly. Still holding her in my arms, I reached down my head and kissed her lips. I knew you would follow. She was still weak as she lowered herself to the ground, the water pouring down her face, pressing her hair flat against her skull. Holding my hand, she peered through the silvery curtain of water. Where's the crucible? She led me from beneath the fountain, 
Blood no longer issued from her hands and feet. She was purified. The bulk of the witness lay, witnesses lay face down in the wet ash, still maintaining a muffled chant, and from across the square came a score of naked men and women, pulling a wooden tumbrel upon which stood upright a thing of copper and brass. A great cylinder with a domed top. From the dome issued tubes and vents. I had never seen one so large, but I knew it was an alchemist's crucible. The chemical womb, where the elements were blended and fresh elements created. You have done well, said Labusa to them, and now you must prepare the catenus uteri. There is little time, nec temere, nec timidi. Her blood was now my own. It was fire in me. I was a god. They place the crucible beneath the black cross and begin the work of bringing it to life. Great bellows heaved, charcoal blossomed red, steam and sparks poured into the darkling air. Monsorbier and the priestess supervised this work, while Lebusa embraced me, smiling more tenderly than ever before. It is all as it should be, my darling. Every ingredient, every equation, every formula... At the moment of the concordance, we shall be joined. Do you fear this, little one? I fear nothing, madam. I am yours. She stroked my body. The combination of the tincture and her touch upon me made me gasp. And if that were ecstasy, what could the ultimate ecstasy she promised be? I trembled as we approached the crucible. Monsorbier lifted up the helm still glowing from the, rem from the remains of its contents. The red light from the furnace fell upon all our faces. The heat was terrific. Monsorbier and the golden girl grinned in their mystical glee. Labusa's arm was around my shoulders. She stood gracefully, staring up at the hazy sky. It grew darker. I placed my own arm about her waist, and for a moment it was as if we were rustic lovers, taking the air in the evening fields. I had no intimation of what was to come, but it was enough for me that we were to be married. It did not matter that future. It did not matter what future she sought to create. I would serve her however she wished. This thought was enough to thrill my blood, her blood. The time of the lion whispered the golden girl, shall be upon us. The time of the lamb is past. I recalled her lovely innocent lips, rimmed with the blood of the sacrificial creature. I recalled Monsorbier's cruel carelessness, his lust for revenge. These were poor servants for my mistress, I thought. The beast shall be set free, murmured Monsorbier. All who refuse his worship shall be destroyed. So shall cowardice be cleansed from the world. I looked to Labusa, who said nothing to contradict him. But the beast must be banished, I said. He's part of the old time. There can be no real justice or harmony if he comes over with us. Labusa pursed her lips, frowning at me, demanding silence. Monsorbier flashed a glance from her to me, to the priestess, who said, we combine our forces, sir, and so ensure success. It was agreed that if we helped you two in this transmutation, you would help us in our ambition. But they are at odds. I felt wounded, fearing fresh betrayal. There is no reconciliation between reason and the beast. Labusa wished me to say nothing. I could only suppose she intended to settle the matter later, when the power was fully hers. They are reconciled, she said. We have found a satisfactory formula. The talk was too familiar from my commune days. By such compromises we had lost all we hoped to achieve. Yet my silence was assured. I loved Labusa. If she wished me to say nothing of our mutual principles, nothing would be said. Nonetheless, I remained perturbed. Both Monsorbier and the priestess had shown that they would use any bestial means to achieve their ends. Surely Labusa found them as degenerate as I did. She drew me closer to her. 
In spite of the unnatural strength in my veins, I yet grew weak at her touch. I smiled into her face, from which some of the pallor had gone, driven out perhaps by the flame from the crucible, which grew hotter by the moment. She returned my attention to the sky. Do you detect any alteration, little one? The dust was swirling faster, while the autumn stars continued to emit their faded light. I believe that she detected a change in the configuration of the heavens, but I could see no difference. My betrothed looked again upon her crucible. She stretched out her resurrected limbs to feel the heat upon her flesh. She uttered a lazy yawn, and she might have been a lion herself. Her tawny skin glowed with its old vitality. Her breathing was more rapid. She pointed to the upper chamber of the machine. Tis in there will be reunited forever. <clears throat> Tis in there will be united forever. Within that metal womb there is space for our bodies. We shall enter it at the exact moment of the full concordance. It seemed to me that we would hardly both fit into the little room, and it would be mighty hot if we did. She noted my uncertainty. The Grail shall go with us, Von Beck, to provide spiritual fire, as the crucible provides our temporal. We shall eat what I must eat. Now you have the blood and the tincture mixed within you. Next I must take that blood and tincture within me. This shall occur at the moment of maximum power. It is in all the grammars. For 1647 years, 7 months, 13 weeks and 9 days have the alchemical adepts worked to achieve the specific moment. True, we have worked in different ways and sometimes, as Mon Sorbier and I have done, towards different ends. But between us we have accumulated wisdom enough to predict the exact moment when the stars conjoin and the new era begins. This knowledge shall give us control of the fate of the world. We have waited long, little Von Beck. Great men and women have lived entire lives, accepted torture and death to bring about this moment. John D. said we shall be called Monas, the One. He devoted every moment in his search for a formula enabling us to create the One. Before him came the great Paracelsus, and Cleopatra, of course, who searched for balance and harmony, the two paramount goals of the alchemical life. Are you aware, sir, of the numbers who searched and experimented, writing their learned works so that you and I could be joined on this day? She returned her frowning concentration to the sky. I shuddered and grew suddenly cold. We shall be united, she said in a whisper, with all this. And her hands went out to encompass the universe. Two great concordances have occurred since the adepts began their work. Both times we failed to take our advantage. We were not sufficiently ruthless. Henry Cornelius Agrippa exhorted us to dedication in his three books. And Basil Valentine was urgent that we take advantage of this concordance, for it would be our last chance. Our master, Hermes Trismegistus, even Cagliostro, every one of them living and dead shall be vindicated, for the occult reign shall soon begin. All will be in balance. All male and female shall be equal. All injustices shall be abolished. Can you not see that whatever I choose to do now is right, so long as it achieves that harmony? The beast is not harmony. He should die. But I was entranced by her enthusiasm and could only accept it. My arguments seemed dull and pointless in my own ears. Sweat shone on our bodies as the crucible's heat turned from red to white. The darkness wavered in that radiance, and again I imagined the lion stalking back and forth as Monsorbier had stalked before the friend indeed, with lash and tail, waiting as impatiently as Labussa for the moment. The sword of Paracelsus was like an icicle against my back, and recalling Lucifer's urgent pleading that I use that sword to win the greatest possible advantage, Labussa too had said she had a use for the sword. There was now a distinct flickering in the sky, a shift as if one thin plate of glass slid across another. 
The autumn stars seemed unchanged, but behind them were now fresh points of light. Unchanged, but behind them there were now fresh points of light. Lobosa grew alert. Tis coming, she shivered. Oh, it is coming. The priestess and Monsorbier also peered out into the stars. Aye, said my old enemy with grim satisfaction. And we are ready. The earth lurched, it seemed, and became unstable, perhaps an illusion caused by what took place in the sky. There was still no sign of the spe spectacular conjunction Lobosa had promised, and I became uneasy. If all her calculations had been wrong, then what would she do? Would I be of no further use to her? More heat, she demanded of the acolytes who set to with their bellows until the crucible must surely explode. Another slight flickering above caused her to turn her eager burning face to the top chamber of the Katnos Uteri. Oh, madam, we shall be consumed, said I. She shook her head. Fear not, the chamber shall hold us for as long as it is needed. The grail will protect us. Now I had to call upon a faith near as great as her own, yet I knew I should possess the necessary courage while the tincture in her own brave blood flowed in me. I believed we were inviolable, and that we should become one flesh as she promised, and would emerge to rule the world in the name of reason. My scepticism was in abeyance. As long as we were together I cared for nothing else. I was ready to step as willingly as any Shadrach, into the fiery womb and feel no pain. My body was already blossoming with a delicious numbness, together with a sensation of joyous ecstasy, all from within. My flesh was armour which nothing could pierce. No weapon, no heat, no cold. As the autumn stars subtly flickered for the third time, Lobosa whispered very quiet in my ear, you must be ready to use the sword as I direct. When that task's done, you'll hand me the blade. Obedient, I nodded to show I understood her instruction. There was a rapid, noisy shuddering in the earth. Distantly, all around, here and there, the deeper city's older buildings fell as if shaken by a tartary tremor. Slowly the shuddering ceased, and there came another movement in the sky. Sudden, flickering streaks of colour. New patterns appeared behind the old. When I studied them under Lobosa's guidance, I made out familiar constellations from my own earthly realm. They all come together, you see, she murmured. A million spheres in conjunction. More. The middle march and our world combining. And as they combine, so do they marry with all the other planes of existence. And as they congregate, Van Beck, so do they turn. Soon, the priestess stood beside us as if to utter an invocation, soon the old stars shall begin their dance. And when the dance is finished, said Monsorbier in a calm, matter-of-fact voice, as if he issued orders from a tribune's desk, the new positions shall be fixed, the new order shall be established. Their voices continued, but became distant to my ears. I seemed divorced from them, from everything save Lobosa. She squeezed my arm and led me closer to the crucible. The acolytes grew so hot it seemed their skin bubbled on hands and faces. Yet crazily they continued to pump, to feed the noisy furnace. It should be hotter still, she demanded. I had seen these creatures attack and kill, yet nonetheless, nonetheless I pitied their condition, though doubtless they felt little pain as I felt none at all. There... The golden priestess pointed. At last, a single autumn star had begun to move, describing a shallow arc across the blackness. The huge pink and yellow disc was surrounded by a halo of dusty lilac. Astra Sultant, murmured the girl, relishing the Latin words as another might roll wine on their tongue. Monsorbier's face now seemed clear of all corruption. The depravity and cruelty fell away from him in an instant as he wondered at that marvel, his lips parting like a schoolboy's. 
He craned his head back to follow the star, progressing with stately majesty across the cluttered heavens. Another moved as if it must surely crash into its fellow. It was smaller, faint ochre in colour. The stars are dancing, said Monsorbier. Oh, it is beautiful. The crucible began to tremble and groan on its base. Small, strange, whining noises escaped it. It could be heated no higher, mistress, cried an attendant. She said softly to me, Prepare your sword, my love. I slung the scabbard from my back. I drew forth that superb blade. The polished steel reflected every light, almost as if the universe in miniature lived in my sword. The pommel was vibrant, but misty, providing only a glimpse of the still screaming eagle. His mad eyes glared urgently at me for a moment before they vanished. For all its weight, the sword had uncanny balance, resting lightly in my palm. My love for Labusa informed my love at that moment for the blade. I looked upon it in joyful wonderment. All my life has been led in order to achieve this moment. Two more great stars moved in unison across the sky, and the dance began in earnest. From a distant point came a dark yellow sun moving forward seeming to fade as it grew to twice its size. Then it danced to the north, held steady for a moment, and then to the south. Other stars swirled around it, first in small groups, then in scores, then seemingly in thousands, sweeping and swirling, describing exact geometrical figures, moving in concert as they had always moved, but at incredible speeds. It could have been the course of their original progression through the heavens, but what had taken millions of years now came about in the space of minutes. The sky was alive with the yellow colours of those dancing stars as they performed to the, me the measures of their cosmic galliard. Still precise, still majestic, there seemed a simple joy in the nature of their movement, like dignified old men and women determined to relish the life remaining to them. Sometimes they created mysterious pictures with features shifting and transmogrifying and colours changing. The shades became subtler now as the great stars drew closer together. The witnesses moaned in awe and moved in awkward imitation of those mighty suns. The deeper city lost its appearance of nocturnal gloom and instead promised dawn. Her buildings still swayed and tilted, whispered and creaked. But they were no longer mere black silhouettes. Their brick and stone was washed with warm light, revealing individual features. They lost their menace and their mystery as they were displayed in their decrepitude. Great cracks were visible in their walls. Pieces of masonry flaked and fell. Chimneys twisted and crumbled. Windows were distorted as were doors, while shutters hung at unlikely angles. The spiral streets were undulating, rippling like flood water down the steep hills towards the centre, where we stood upon the O'Dowd's demolished dream. Meanwhile, beside me, the instigator of that ruin, the arch arsonist Monsorbier, whistled through his teeth as he observed the ever moving firmament. Our crucible now threw off vapour from its trembling metal, as if it must soon melt. Labossa turned to Monsorbier. Give me the grail. He turned abstractly, as if he could not remember who she was. Last night, when we made our bargain, you said you had captured something in the depths. You said I would recognise it. Aye. Casually, he handed her the upturned helm, his main attention still upon the dancing stars. Well, sir, I demand you reveal it to me before the concordance. Dreamily, he shook his head. No, madam, after. And then, to my utter surprise, Labossa said to me, Kill them both, Von Beck. Kill them quickly. I was obedient. I could be little else. I was hers. The sword, light as ever, jumped in my grasp, almost anticipating my action. And I had sliced off Monsorbier's wide-eyed head, and I had cut down the golden priestess in an instant, 
and the sword had done what it did before in the O'Dowd sewers. It had quartered them, all in the space of a second, precise as an experienced butcher. The limbs were neatly sliced from the torso and lay so that only by careful inspection could it be seen that they were not all of a piece. Yet this was certainly no trick instinctively learned from the Tatars. This, I was convinced, was the chief property of the sword itself. Now, it was no wonder that the enemies of Paracelsus had feared it. If I said I had assassinated Monsorbier and the priestess, I should scarcely describe the true sense of the event. That they deserved death was not in question, but I had acted as little on my own volition as the sword had acted on mine. I had merely been Lebus's instrument. I felt no pang of conscience, no self-disgust. Not then, though I had performed an action at odds with all I had, that all I held honourable and humane. Slowly a certain distress filled me as I watched Labusa stooping up cheerfully as any farm lass gathering sticks, to pick up the severed limbs and fling them into the furnace. In went an arm, and in a golden head. In went Monsorbier's mildly astonished face. Would all of us soon be reduced to miscellaneous rubbish tossed into a stove? Was this the future Labusa sought to create? Madam, I would not wish to do such a thing again, I said, fearing lest my disgust angered her, for my love was as fierce as ever, my loyalty to her as complete. This was no part of the prescription you offered me. You spoke, as I did, against blatant treachery, immoral life-taking, and this is as bad as anything I'd been called upon to perform in France. Monsorbier, sir, was evil and ruthless, nor was his precities less guilty of crime. That's reason to shun them, madam, not to kill them. Well, you slew them, sir. Their blood continued to stain my steel, and until it was off I had no wish to sheathe the weapon. True, said I sadly. Lavosa frowned. It is a question of time, von Beck. There is so little now. You had made a compact with that pair, and you never intended to keep it. I did not wish to preserve with the argument. I did not wish to persevere with the argument. I dropped my gaze to the black ash at my feet. I could tell that her anger grew. What, sir? She challenged me. Shall you betray me also, like Klosterheim, at this crucial hour? No, madam, I shall not, but I cannot be dumb. By these actions we remain in league with the beast. We succumb to fear, however subtly. No new age can ever be truly that, if it be founded upon the methods and follies of the old. I learned as much in France. It is how I came to leave Paris and meet you. You were destined to leave and come here for your marriage. Aye, madam. This acquiescence satisfied her. She did not give a whit for my opinions or my sensibilities, so long as I continued to maintain the course I had committed myself to, body and soul. I would rather die than be separated from her. Yet, I would have given a great deal for St. Audrin's reassuring vulgarity at that moment. I had murdered in cold blood and without a thought. There was no escaping that grim fact. The colours flooded over us. The monstrous stars continued their elaborate dance. The deeper city shook and swayed, with all those naked witnesses to our coming. Marriage huddled back from us, perhaps convinced now that they too should soon be slaughtered by my surgeon's cutlass. I had a sickening notion that they were right to be afraid of me. Monsorbier's elegant bicorn, still with its tricolour cockade, lay at my feet. I picked it up and used it to clean the blade. The sword's pommel reflected the light above, all turbulent, misty colour, but then cleared to show the eagle. Flinging himself against the crystal, his coppery wings beating harder than ever, his furious claws extending and contracting. Labusa and I moved towards the fuming crucible. All the ashes stirred around us, reheating and smoking. Her tone was kind again. Come, sir. 
This is a marriage requiring no officiant. Together we already possess more authority than any living creature, and soon we shall enjoy omnipotence. But though I could do nothing save obey her, the joy was already gone from it. There remained the thrilling anticipation of pleasure, the satisfaction that the union was about to come about, the curiosity as to what we might expect as the resolution of all that ritual. But she had refused to banish the beast, and the purity was lost for me. We stand at the tangential core, she said. No other sentient creature occupies this space. He who holds it shall impose all his dreams upon the generality, affecting every future moment in mankind's history. We shall describe those terms, von Beck. Could God himself ask for more? We shall set down the terms of the human condition. There was a roaring from above as if an ocean were bursting through the skies to engulf us. But it was the tidal movement of the stars themselves as they began the concluding measures of the dance. Every colour there had ever been was now represented in the sky. Points of hard light, swirls of soft, like watching eyes behind great war banners blowing in the wind. But already the dance was slower. She began to talk with rapid intensity so that my blood and brain quickened. My memories slid away. She was so awesomely confident. You've not hesitated thus far, sir, and you've proved, in sen proved my sense in choosing you. You have great courage for a man, great willingness to see the world afresh, great imagination. Now, sir, tell me you are ready for the last stages of our marriage ritual. I have always been ready, Lubosa. She stroked my flesh. We shall be combined soon, sweet love. One flesh, one mind, one soul. The great prophecy shall be fulfilled, and the yearning of all those mighty adepts shall find resolution at last. The golden work has always led to this moment. For thousands of years, since my people first began their search. She held up the battered helmet. And here's the key without which we might never have succeeded. With it we cannot fail. Is it not the very essence of harmony? You must let me slay the beast, I said. She either did not hear me or refused to listen. The colours were breaking and merging again. The mass of stars grew threadbare. It was possible to see through them to new constellations, hard and sharp upon the misty black. A vast disk dropped below the horizon, and as it fell, its very substance shredded away, like breath on a winter's evening. Another great body simply faded into invisibility. Yet still the dance continued, slower and slower, with fewer suns at every moment. It seemed the remnants of our autumn stars were staggering now, shivering with the fatigue of simply maintaining their existence. They had squandered their last few thousand years of life upon a single splendid galliard. It is coming, she murmured, and held my hand tight. When this finishes, Von Beck, it is the concordance. Are you still loyal? To perform the marriage? I, to your destiny. We were very close to the crucible. I understood now that she meant to confine us to those consign us to those flames. It was her madness. Yet at that moment I was no more free of it than she. If she intended to die, then I would be with her, for that was better than living without her. In the shadows behind that crucible, the, lion, the lion was prowling. I saw light fall intermittently upon his tawny skin. I heard him give a sound, half questioning whine, half threatening growl. Was he afraid to lose his mistress, or was she his sister? I remembered my dream of the Minotaur. Star by noble star, the great orbs faded and were gone. Again the sky appeared to shift, while at the same time it grew deeper, to reveal layer upon layer of points of light, and shining swirls that were galaxies, still moving, but now apparently close to their ultimate positions. It appeared that the point of space upon which we stood was the only fixed matter in the whole universe, as if the Earth, or our part of it, refused rotation. 
Perhaps that was why the tall buildings of the deeper city had still not ceased their swaying. They resisted the general gravity. The lion made a low, unsettled noise. The crucible, groaning and whispering, was still white hot. Lubusa herself bent to heave upon the bellows. There was a rush and flame flowered. It achieved a steady roar. She smiled as she moved closer to the crucible. She reached her hand towards me. Quickly, we must become one at the very moment of concordance. Quickly, Von Beck. Her red lips opened as if she was swallowing fire. Her powerful body vibrated with anticipated lust. Or was it merely greed? Come. Lobosa, said I, I love you for who you are. I love you as a human creature. I know that. You are the perfect woman. Your femininity is positive and potent. Your spirit is the bravest. Your mind the keenest. Your body the most beautiful. I love you, Lobosa of Crete, and I offer myself to you in matrimony. Come then, sir. Come and let's get on with it. Her back was almost against the fiery metal of the crucible. I looked at her wonderful naked body and almost wept. She held the helm in her left hand and beckoned to me with her right. She was smiling. Her lips were soft. She cajoled me. Come, sir. This is no casual decision of mine, Lobosa. She smiled. Your pride remains with you, my dear. Very well, if you wish it. I acknowledge your masculine generosity. I give myself up to you. I moved slowly towards her. Her lips were parted again, her red lips. Her teeth gleamed and her eyes were cloudy with desire. Come, little one. The crucible sputtered and the charcoal hissed. I saw a blackened hand twisting in the furnace as if Monsorbier waved a sardonic farewell. Lobosa threw open the crucible's door, and she was careless of its heat. Within I saw white fire glaring. In there, little one, for the final blending, we shall be a single body. The two shall become one. Do you understand, little Von Beck? I was now standing close to her, my naked flesh touching hers. The heat was terrific, but I could feel it no more than she. We were truly invulnerable, it seemed. She bent her head to kiss me upon the lips. She took a long, delicious kiss, as if she savoured me for the first time, and she sighed. Ah, oh, sir, you cannot know what joy your courage purchases, but it will not be long before you are rewarded. Give me your sword, little one. I made to pass her the blade, but in spite of me, my hand refused to move. Give me your sword. In her eyes was the suggestion of a frown. I forced my arm to move, to offer up the scabbarded steel. She stared languorously at me, her breath loud in her throat. Oh, my beauty, she purred. Promises shall be kept by us both, I swear. Her fingers touched the hilt and she gasped in pain. Ah, what's this? I had forgotten. It was worse than any grail. It is my sword, I said, but therefore I am sure it would not do you harm, Lobosa, since we are almost one even now. With the grail still in her left hand, she reached determinedly, determinedly for the sword's hilt, plainly controlling great agony as, deliberately, she drew forth the blade from its scabbard. She smiled again to me, and I knew fear. For the first time I understood that she meant to slice me up as I had sliced Monsorbier. Perhaps she truly believed she would resurrect me when the deed was done, by placing my remains in the crucible. Or did she intend to eat me? I knew enough of alchemical notions of how adepts believed they could confer immortality on themselves and others by the process of dismemberment. The quartered corpse was duly resurrected. They hoped in water or sometimes fire or both. I looked into Lobusa's eyes and saw the truth. Oh, madam, 
as at my execution. She was smiling still. It shall be true immortality, Von Beck. We shall soon become a single hermaphroditic creature. Hermaphroditus Rex shall rule upon the earth. It is all true, little one. Have faith, as I had faith upon the cross, and we shall be assured of eternal life. It is so. You must believe me now. Come, waste no more time. The astral concordance is here. The scabbard dropped free into the ash at her feet. She stood, with lips drawn back and teeth gritted, framed against the glowing copper and brass of her chemical womb. The cup in one hand, the sword in the other. Her tawny skin had always held its own radiance, but now she herself seemed made of metal, and she reflected the glare from the crucible. And she continued to smile. Her body was enough to draw me close to her. Her sex, her beauty, her power. She required no logic to coax me. Her hand holding the sword shook as if every nerve knew excruciating pain. Come. I was reminded of the icon I had seen at Prince Miroslav's, and then of Miroslav himself, split by a sword and clinging so hard to life of the warnings he had given first her, and then me. Momentarily alarmed, I stepped back. His smile vanished. Her expression was agony and disbelief mingled. Little one, come quickly. I could not, though I opened my mouth. I was frozen. Little one, she was close to weeping. She was incredulous. You gave me your oath. I forced myself again to move forward. Relieved, she stood with arms outstretched, almost as if she still hung upon the cross. Come! Slowly panting, I tried to push my body towards her. I felt that my own agony echoed hers. I grunted. I gasped. What is it, little one? Why can't you come to me? The beast. My breath was noisy in my throat. Leave him behind. Slay him first. We have no need of him. She laughed. He shall be our imprisoned power. There is no need to discard such power if it is truly contained. I have tamed the beast, Von Beck. Come to me, Von Beck. Dismiss the beast, Lobosa. Kill him, I beg you. Let our harmony be one with nothing but our love and faith. Kill the beast, and I promise I shall let you do what you wish. Your risk, Lobosa, must be as great as mine. <laughs> what? In her obsession, she was all but uncomprehending. Would you betray me now? You betray yourself. You betray us both. Reject the beast. The grail must be defended. The beast defends it. Fool, is this all mere excuse for cowardice? I stood still again. My eyes were fixed upon her body. I was a few feet from her. If I was to be executed, I would rather it were there. Slay the beast, and then you may slay me. Let the minotaur be abolished forever from our world, Lobosa. It is the only way. I offer you resurrection, Von Beck, and eternal life. The furnace, fueled still by flesh and blood, began to howl and scream, as if demanding further sacrifice. I was weeping helplessly. Still my feet would not move. In the shadows I was sure the lion still prowled, prowled, ready to kill me if, I, if she did not. I wished so much to go to her, no matter what she promised or I threatened, but my body was immobile with terror, an enormous effort brought me another step nearer. Above us in that smoking sky, the last of the autumn stars went out. In that black stillness now remained only a myriad of cold white points, hard as the angry eyes of God. Their movement had stopped entirely. The earth became utterly silent. A hushed tension infected the universe. It was as if everything in creation awaited the outcome of my decision. The concordance was upon us. The concordance of every sphere, of every occult and natural realm was upon us. Lines of light began to pass now from star to star, until soon the entire firmament was an infinitely complex web of gold and silver threads. It was astonishingly beautiful, and those threads shot down to touch us. Yet the darkness remained. Now I grew aware that the darkness was filling with the scream. 
the fiery glow of our chemical womb, as if the flames of hell combined and were concentrated therein. There's still time, she whispered. She was an imploring statue with her cup and sword. I mean you only good, Von Beck. I offer life, power, union. I offer harmony, a cure for the world's pain. You have drunk my tincture and my blood. Does that mean naught to you, my own betrothed? Please do not betray, betray my faith in you. Madam, if you embrace the beast, you betray me. Those threads of light curled about us as if curious to inspect the upturned helm, the grail. My betrayal, it seemed, was not of any great importance to her scheme. I swayed. I dragged at my muscles until I was moving again. Ah, her hair was a blazing crown as she swung her head to glance into the furnace. She was still shaking with the pain of keeping hold of my sword. Quickly she stepped back into the crucible's open door. Quickly! She roared. Tis almost too late! Behind and above us was the cool light of the new stars. Ahead was the glowing furnace. All these things were to be married at once as we were married. I was to become part of that wholeness. This thought helped me revive my legs until I walked a few further steps, aware that the enormous heat from the crucible did not burn me, neither did the white radiance from within blind me. At last I stood beside her again. Though unharmed by the flames, I could still feel the warmth and wonder of her flesh. I touched her and leaned up to kiss her lips, but her eyes no longer looked at me. Those eyes had turned to molten brass. Not yet. She was a whispering volcano. I shall never be able to explain the next sequence of happenings. I no longer hesitated. No matter what my argument, I was drawn to her, passing fluidly into that hissing chemical womb, my body alive with the terrible coldness and a terrible heat. They were consuming me. I was melting. Lubusa. Within it, it was as though a silver universe heated and cooled, and then heated again all around me. I was trembling and weak, but my faith, since I was as yet unhurt, was improving rapidly. By now I should have been dead. Instead, there was liquid metal in my veins. My eyes were steel, tempered and re-tempered a thousand times. My brain lost all indistinct thoughts. Every impression, every idea had the clarity of a perfect diamond. I held up my arm. My skin flowed like quicksilver. I looked up and saw the grail. She held it above my head. We shall be the new messiah. Her voice rang like a golden bell. We shall begin our ministry on earth. Let them call us Antichrist or Daemon or anything they wish. But we shall define them and that will be inescapable. The concordance encompasses us. Kneel. I obeyed her. We begin the marriage of sulphur and mercury, that each may feed upon the other's flesh and blood. Thus shall our conjoining echo, the conjoining of the million realms, and lead us towards our resolution and our magistery. Behold the fulfilment of our art, the coming together of the bride and groom, and their becoming one. I looked up into her incandescent beauty as she raised the sword. My lips opened and I cried out my love for her, all my divine love for her. There was metal in me. There was metal in my womb. I was fully alive. Now I give my blood and my flesh, O Lubusa. I give you all my life. And you are drinking from the cup. And you are smiling down on me while our crucible rocks and wails. You plunge the point of the sword into the cup and fresh fire blossoms. Your features are again my features and seem to fuse, then become molten again and writhe and smoke. But you are frowning. Your eyes are suddenly puzzled. The crucible begins to shake. A different light fills our womb. I try to rise, but my limbs seem truly severed. The light comes from the grail and is in a cold light, like the starlight outside. And it opposes that which melts and marries us. 
the grail begins to utter a sound like the muffled tolling of a gigantic bell. It contains anger. It protests. Throw away the sword, my sister. My bride, I beg thee to banish the beast. Renounce him, and we shall be truly wed. Throw away the sword. Renounce the beast. She raged, and she screamed in her agony, but she would not discard the sword. Her flaming hair erupted about her head. Brazen lips screamed their furious pain, and burning copper eyes became of themselves a terrible holocaust. No, she would not be ruled. Neither would she be controlled in any way. Not by me. Not by any supernatural agency. Not even by herself. Not at this moment, the greatest moment of our power. No! Our crucible, our cradle, our womb creaks and sways. The grail light gradually fills it, banishing that other more hectic incandescence. You fling it from you, but it does not fall. Instead, it hangs directly overhead, continuing to give full voice to its distress and anger. It tells us clearly how we produce a mere parody of harmony, in direct conflict with its own. It will not go in alliance with the sword or the beast. Yet you will not give up the blade. Instead, taking it in your two hands, you bring the blade, blow upon terrible blow, against the dented metal of the helm, and you are shrieking with anguish. But all you achieve is a deeper tolling, beating more rapidly now and seeming to grow. Golden tears start from your eyes. Your mouth is unstable brass, and silver saliva streams unchecked into your surrounding aura. The blade begins to buckle. You cry out in your frustration, and now I understand how peaceful is the grail. How more profound a destiny has been contained in me than ever any of us believed. For you have reversed the ruined sword, and you are bringing the pommel hard against the cup, down again, and the cup is as unmoving, as fixed in its position as those stars outside. You attack bedrock. Deeper comes the note of the bell, faster until it vibrates the entire chemical womb. You smash the sword's pommel for the third time against the lip of the grail. Your voice defies it. No, she cried. She would not be cheated. It was unjust to cheat her. My blood, my flesh, the steel in my womb, all were unstable now. A dozen metals swirling and shrieking were in conflict therein. Drops of silver and gold fell upon me. Drops of silver and gold fall upon my severed limbs, and now here is pain at last. Yet my body heals. Every wound heals the moment it is made. But it is such agony. The marriage is not complete. I struggle towards you. Your face is the face of Medusa. Throw away the sword, Labusa. I reach towards her. Her agony is without reward. Labusa, throw away the sword, and we shall be united. No, the ruby pommel has touched the rim of the grail for the third time. The Messiah is stillborn. The ruby crystal burst with such deafening loudness it seemed to shatter my ears and drowned the booming voice of the grail. Labusa paused. She was startled. Her mouth opened, but she did not speak. The grail grew silent. Slowly its light withdrew into it, and then faded until it was just an ordinary antique battle hat again. Labusa plucked it from the air. She stared abstractly from it to me. I began to climb to my feet. My body was so sore, so lacerated, so reddened by strange wounds about my throat, shoulders and thighs, that I groaned in my distress and my despair. She raised, lifted the ruined sword again, turned towards me. Her eyes had lost their heat, and her lovely breasts lifted and fell even more rapidly than mine. I moved towards her to embrace her or be slain. I did not care. You were coward for too long, she said. You allowed the moment to pass. No, Labusa, you should have slain the beast. 
Is that what Monsorbier brought up from the depths? I saw nothing. I knew not what he brought. You do not see the lion. She shook her head. It was the beast, I said. The grail protested. It had grown very cold. Those who would harness the power of the beast to rule their fellows shall be destroyed by it. Maria, the Jewess, gave us the warnings in all her writings. You must remember. She stiffened like steel plunged in ice. She drew her wonderful brows together, looking down to the shattered ruby at her feet. Something moved there. It was a tiny, fluttering creature. A phoenix. No, it was the eagle, released at last from its captivity. It was the beast within the sword. Now I understood the pattern and I was afraid. I reached out to her, but she ignored me. I believed I had no importance for her since I had failed to keep my bargain. She grinned as she dropped the sword and stooped to cup her hands around the bird. It screeched. It resisted. It was all noisy anger. She imprisoned it within her palms, looking at it through a chink in her fingers. Then, placing this cage to her ear, she listened. Lobosa. Could I be of so little worth to her? Would she discard me so completely? I saw no reason why she should not. In her eyes I had failed to accept the greatest challenge offered to humankind. The crucible had grown cold. I stepped out into warmer darkness, cheered by an ordinary heat. The heat from the furnace and the ashes. The fire was almost spent. Overhead traceries of light formed a pure and rational geometry. In wonderment I looked upon perfection. All we had sought to achieve was shown to be rude savagery in comparison. Lubusa, I wanted her to see so that she would know and be heartened. Lubusa, but she remained within the crucible, speaking in a low voice to her miniature king of birds. I looked up into the mighty tranquillity of a fully ordered universe. I began to weep. And then suddenly she was shouting, There's still time! Bursting from the crucible, she rushed through billowing ash toward the black cross. The vile gibbet still stood where we left it. Out of the drifting dust, figures began to rise. The last of her congregation. Dust clung to her naked body. I called to her, but she did not hear. She would not hear me. I had ceased to exist. Lubusa, stop still loved her. Her followers began slowly to stumble or crawl in the direction of the cross. Their filthy bodies, their wretched faces, their horrible weakling eyes caused me to wonder if I resembled them now. Had that been my true destiny? She turned with her back to the cross. What could she be planning? To begin the ritual over? It was too late. The concordance was here. She called out. Come. From behind me I heard an echoing shriek. A shriek that displayed a fierce thirst for revenge. How long had that bird been locked within the sword? Had Paracelsus harnessed the beast? Or had the sword been forged during an earlier concordance? It shrieked again, reminding me of Klosterheim's screech as he fell towards this very spot. Had my old enemy been reincarnated so quickly? I turned towards the crucible. The metal had cooled and the horrid fire was out. But from within the sphere, his great body framed for a moment against the fading luminosity within. His eyes as mad and wounded as Lobusa's. The spires of his feathers rattling as he shook his huge wings, strutted a massive golden eagle. Without pausing, he took to the air. He was the shining one now. He it was who seemed made all of copper and brass as he beat his way up into the brilliant night. He had been born and reached maturity thanks to the last shreds of our crucible's magic. Labusa's body was flat against the black charred wood of the cross. Her gaze followed the eagle's flight. Up he went toward the orderly web of starlight. Higher and higher he flew until at least he had vanished. At last he had vanished. 
I sighed in relief, unable to guess why I feared him more than I had feared anything else. Lubusa, I love you. Come from this place. There is yet hope. I wanted her so much. Still, I would have died for her. There, there is work you and I can do, Lubusa. The Grail would aid us if we obeyed its rules. I shall make the only rules, Von Beck. You hesitated. You failed us both. I warned you against the beast. Come away from here, Lubusa. I beg you. Accept my love. What does that mean, Von Beck? She shivered, her whole body blue with cold. She stretched up and tried to touch the horizontal timber with her fingertips. She turned back. If you would serve me still, you must re-crucify me. Will you prove your love by doing that? Helplessly, I said. I will do anything, Lobosa. You still cannot understand. Good, then help me up, man. There's even less meaning to this ritual, I told her softly. The moment's gone, you said so. It's true. All her old authority returned to her voice. If you love me, and as you say, Von Beck, you will do as I ask. I obey you. I shall always obey you. Upon your instructions, your servants replace the crucible upon its tumbrel and roll it until it stands at the base of the cross. Climbing on this, we help you back to your original position. The nails are in my hand. You display your stigmata. The holes go clean through you, but they do not bleed. It is not difficult to replace the nails so that you hang almost in contentment, breathing with difficulty, your head upon your shoulder, your eyes looking up to the myriad intersecting streams of light. Thank you, Von Beck, you say. You may leave me now, but I am disobedient in this one thing. I kiss you upon your cheek, your lips, your breasts, your stomach, and your sex. Flesh is so cold, I would warm it with my own breath. You begin to laugh, but it is a terrible mockery of laughter, containing so much torment that it is possible to believe your pain might indeed be half the world's. I fall back, blocking my ears. This is the, la this is the least bearable of all the hideous sounds which lately came to me. I cry out, unable to stop my own pathetic pleading. I roll from the roof of the crucible into the ashy filth below. I got slowly to my feet. Her laughter continued. She stared directly at me. Her pain and her cynicism were torment for me. I threw my weight against the crucible, scattering her witnesses, and I pushed at it, rocking it until it had crashed over. As soon as it fell, the metal sphere cracked, steaming. I searched among pieces of ruptured metal, looking for the helmet. The Grail would save her. I was convinced. The Grail would heal us both, for it cured all pain. As I searched, I heard her laughter cease. There was a dreadful silence. A silence of expectation. What more could happen? Frantically, I continued to search. And then, from the darkness above, I heard the beating of huge wings. I looked up. The eagle was rushing back, as if that had been its purpose all along. His curved beak opened in a ghastly croak. His monstrous claws were extended. He fell towards us, striking as if we were prey, his mad, betrayed eyes fixed upon the cross. Unconsciously, I fell back, certain I was his victim. But I was wrong. He had marked the crucified woman. In a hideous confusion of flapping wings and fainting talons, his claws were raking her, and his croaking was muffled as his beak rent her flesh. Lubusa, my love. She had begun to laugh again, the same chilling laugh. She jerked upon the cross but could not get free. Every movement, movement added ruin to her body. She did not wish to die in this way, but was yet amused by the irony. Desperately I search now for my weapon. Here is the twisted remains of my Paracelsian dissector. Picking up the shard, I fling myself towards the cross. Still the eagle feeds, and still the woman laughs, alive though already half eaten. Clambering upwards, I am weeping as I stab wildly at the gigantic bird. 
It is my own body he kills. He screams, his movements growing more agitated. I am inflicting monstrous wounds on him. Labossa, he refuses to turn on me. He is possessed. He will feed only off your living flesh. You are blood from head to foot, and now at last your laughter ebbs. I stab at his throat, at his eyes. Your laughter is almost inaudible now. His talons are ripping through your breast, screaming some profoundly obscure victory shout. The eagle holds up one dripping claw, displaying to me your living heart, your beating human heart. Labusa, I love you. A final burst of laughter. Blood pumps. The eagle glares at me almost benevolently. Then his ragged flesh and gory feathers rise into the air and fly up, up towards the fresh conjunction, the blinding heavens. His last scream fills the sky, blending with the fading echoes of Labossa's humour. Labossa, you hang dead upon your black cross without hope of resurrection. You are Antichrist betrayed. How complete was the ritual or reversal which you borrowed from Monsorbier? You did not realise, Labossa, how complete it was. Frantically, I stood upon the remains of the crucible, trying to prise out the nails once more, but I could not get purchase, and my fingers slipped in the blood. I was wailing in my own unbearable grief. I found that I was licking her corpse, licking it clean as an animal would. I had it in mind to make a fire under the crucible again, to fling her remains into her al alchemical womb and somehow bring her back to life. I searched for the spring, which had gushed there not long since and restored her to me. Rubble had collected over it, and as we performed our abortive wedding in his furnace, the buildings of the deeper city had continued to subside. Many were still standing, still swaying and groaning, still tumbling majestically into the pit, fallen towards the tangent where I stood. My face in her belly, my arms about the cross of charred oak. Here there was no history. We were on the very edge of time. Oh, Labusa, tell me what I must do. Tell me your desire. I serve you. It is all I wish to do. More of the tired tenements of Amalorm made a final spastic jig before toppling from the highest rim. Others fell from her many terraces. They flung stone and brick and slate at my feet. There were clouds of dust. The noisy crashing of stone upon stone seemed designed to drive all living creatures out, so there should be no witnesses to their indignity. Only I was left. Up those damaged spirals ran the witnesses and all the other survivors, Everyone fled to the lesser city's dubious sanctuary. Now, Labossa, you were never a villain. You did no wrong which had not already been practised on you. You were martyred, as woman is ever martyred, particularly if she seeks her own power. Is it true, Labossa, that I lacked courage at the last? When I willingly knelt before you and offered blood and flesh in that celebratory wedding feast? I understood now that you meant me no harm, and that all I experienced was probably no more than your inspired insanity, the power of your will over mine, my lust for your person. I think you truly believed you could make us one creature, one physical, hermaphroditic immortal. It was not I that slew you, remember? You do understand as much, I am certain. Neither did you slay yourself or engineer self-destruction. It was an inheritance from the past which brought about our ruin. You would not relinquish the past any more than I, and you were destroyed by it, as it will always destroy you, that captured beast of Paracelsus, that creature of magic and animal rapacity. Or were we all among the victims of cunning Lucifer? power of the beast cannot be controlled. It must be abolished. The Grail protested because you sought to pervert its function. In your anger you released the beast, and in return the beast ripped out your heart and flew with it into the stars. Are you fated, Labusa? 
in some other universe to suffer forever that Promethean martyrdom? Or does your heart beat forever in hell? You cannot hesitate now, you cried, as the stars conjoined. You commanded me to enter the chemical womb. I trust you with my future, with my spirit. Do not fail me, Von Beck. Thus woman trusts in man down all the years, and so, as always, is betrayed. <laughs>